Hey pop kids, welcome to uh, episode 65 of Mark Talks at His Mobile Phone about old pop groups and things that he likes and still does like. It is, uh, I think, the 2nd of March, 2021. Uh, lockdown 3D, Reve the revenge is still ongoing uh, and I'm still talking about music. There are still some records I own that I haven't yet spoken about. I know that's a shocker, but there we are. Today, I'm going to pick up one of an irregular series of episodes. Uh, I'm talking at, at the moment about a number of bands that I like. New Order, U2, uh, and this one, Suede. And today I'm going to be talking about Suede's fourth album, Head Music. Uh, first and foremost, um, on behalf of Suede, I have to apologise to people in America who have been quite excited about the announcement of a show by Suede somewhere in, I think, Newark or New Jersey or somewhere like that. It isn't the good Suede, it's the not good Suede. Uh, and that is still something which which sticks in my craw a little bit. You know, like you've got a scar and, and you want to hide it. Um, the fact that there is somebody else who is far less successful um, and a few people have heard of, and of the people that have heard of them, uh, even less people like them, uh, an American act called Suede, uh, that obviously still gets people and websites excited. That Suede, not this Suede. That Suede are playing America. This Suede, not playing America. Sorry, guys, we feel your pain. Primarily because when Jones Addiction reformed, uh, it took them, I think, uh, 12 years until they got round to playing the UK. And international touring is, is a notoriously uh, unfair and fickle beast geared around ticket sales and likely audience and market shares. So today, talking about the fourth Suede album, Head Music, and um, we're going to pick up uh, at the end of the Coming Up Tour, which was the weekend of Reading Festival, August 1997. I didn't go and see Suede there, I didn't see the Mannix there, I didn't see Metallica there. Um, I went to see U2 at Wembley Stadium instead. Um, I don't regret that choice, and at the same point I do. We're all guilty of not going to more gigs, and I probably should have gone to more gigs while I had the chance, because at the moment I've seen one show uh, since the 7th of March 2020, uh, and that is going to be a year pretty soon. Um, end of 1997... Suede um, decided that they were going to cap off their most successful period coming up album and tour with I think five top ten singles and selling uh, I think probably over a million copies of an album with that good old fashioned uh, greatest hit victory lap the B-Sides album. This is one of the best B-Sides albums ever made. It is called Sci-Fi Lullabies. The picture on the front is gorgeous. I, I just love that picture. Um, and this is, according to the sticker on it, a 27-track double CD with a 32-page colour lyric book with the best of the B-sides that the band have done. And I think a lot of people have been very unfair to, to the B-sides in this period, uh, primarily because if you think about what, what the band were doing at this point, um, you know, they'd had five years with Bernard um, to write and record two albums, and they came up with about 44 songs or thereabouts. And at the same point, uh, when Sci-Fi Lullabies came out... Um, Richard had been in the band for a far shorter period of time, um, three years, three and a half years at most. Um, and he'd done two world tours um, and written somewhere in the region of 30 songs with the rest of the band in that time. So uh, the guy, he certainly wasn't slacking off. I just think it was um, just down to the speed and pace of the band that perhaps they just didn't have so much time to write so many songs. Sci-Fi Lullabies, one of the best B-side albums of all time. And uh, it's got a re-recording on it of... Europe is our playground, um, which uh, that wasn't announced, so you only really knew it was a re-recording of Europe is our playground when you played it. Um, and it's it's you know Europe is our playground is is the song that really kind of pointed the way for where Suede were going to go next. So 1998, Suede, pretty much on top of the world, the Britpop bubble had yet to burst, um, although Be Here Now had just come out. And I think Be Here Now was probably the moment where Britpop evaporated completely. Uh, because as we all know, Be Here Now only sounds good um, if you've got cocaine in your bloodstream. It's a very loud, very long, overindulgent, bloated album that pretty much killed Britpop overnight. Um, and Suede, of course, were the first time that Britpop was seen in 
the press was in relation to an article that featured Swade in, and I don't think Swade were happy about that at all. Um, so that, that kind of phrase first appeared, I think, in Select Magazine in March 1993. So when people say, well, was it Blur or Oasis? I'm going, mate, no. Always, 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 Swade and Pulp. OK, that's that's a hill I will die on. I am a petty human. I have many hills that I will fight to the death on. And Blur or Oasis is one of them because it was always Swade and Pulp that were the best. Anyway, so 1998. And I think it's probably really, really good if you have a copy of this book uh, by Brett Anderson, uh, Afternoons with the Blinds Drawn, uh, which is his his autobiography of the period from the release of the first Suede single to the last Suede single in the band's original incarnation is pretty brutal uh, about life in the band. Um, I think it's all pretty clear to everybody um, that Suede couldn't do the same old thing again. They couldn't come out and come out with that ultra bright, ultra shiny album of, of uh, pop rock um, that was you know clearly aimed at being sung by people that did their hair before they went out on a saturday night and um they had some ideas around what they were going to do next but they knew they couldn't repeat themselves uh, now i'm going to take a, a look at the the booklet that's inside the uh, the head music reissue and in in there brett says uh, for me head music was always the most underrated of all the suede albums and after a punishing 18-month world tour, we were keen to begin work on a record with less of the levity of its predecessor, something colder and more European. And it was the B-side of Trash, Europe is Our Playground, that provided the blueprint as we searched again and again to match its hypnotic elegance. Um, so what the band were trying to do is they knew they couldn't repeat themselves. And they, they were looking for a new sound and a, and a new type of sound. And they found something that kind of echoed in this they found something which kind of echoed parts of bowie's berlin trilogy um parts of of kind of bands like depeche mode uh, and other acts like that where there was a kind of like this, a new order even the darker edges of new order and, and joy division tracks like um, the eternal and decades um as well you know th this was the kind of stuff that i think was influencing the band at this point is that you you had a, a mixture of technology and of organic guitar-based pop music. Um, but there were other things, other other uh, vultures were circling the world of Suede. And if you read this, it's fairly clear that um, Brett was, had started to, I think, to believe his own hype. He said that he, his ego was burgeoning, I believe was the exact phrase that he used. Um, and, and he started working on, on his own in a more concerted manner than he'd done previously. So the sessions for the Head Music album were, I think it's polite to say, difficult, protracted and drawn out. So the band started recording on, uh, I think, August 1998 and finished in March 1999. Um, and that and that start in August 1998 was a full year after the end of the Reading Festival and the coming, coming up tour. So they had a year to write the songs. And to be honest, I don't think that year was particularly kind to them. Um, Brett was taking drugs, a lot of drugs. Um, he's fairly open about that in here. He's fairly open about it in uh, this essential piece of watching as well, The Insatiable Ones, the documentary about Swade. And it's fairly clear that he probably should have taken less drugs. Now, I think probably uh, a, thing, a thing to point out about people, especially people that are often driven by creativity is that they have obsessive personalities you know there is there is a, a a compulsion to behave um and you know certainly i have an addictive personality i don't do things by halves if i like a band i want everything i want to know everything if i like a film director i need to see everything they've done apart from maybe the episodes of csi um if if i if i like an author i'm gonna have all his books and i've got multiple copies of philip k dick books that were published with different titles in different countries even though the books are exactly the same you know if, you, if you're a, an artist you're often an obsessive personality and you're compulsive and you're driven and you know certainly when it comes to creativity I, I had it today, I wrote a song today, that in itself was not worth mentioning, but I didn't know that song was going to happen, it went from being a vaguely formed idea in my head at about five to one, to being something that was finished by about ten past one, and I wrote the whole thing, four verses, choruses, in, in 15 minutes, and, and for me, that's how I create, and some people 
I like that. And, you, you know, when the muse tells you it's time and the ideas fall into your head, that's what you've got to do. And that's a compulsion. Um, really awkward when it happens in meetings. Luckily, it doesn't normally happen in meetings. And I always go everywhere with a notepad and a pen or at the very least a phone. I have been known to drunkenly type lyrics into my phone and text myself song lyrics whilst I'm on the tube, which is a bizarre way of doing it. But it's how I do it. And so Brett was taking a lot of drugs. Uh, and rather than, than, than go into any particular uh, detail around that, um, actually, I've just opened a quote here, page 221 of Afternoon with the Blinds Drawn. Uh, Brett says, by this point in my career, I think that my ego was, to say the least, burgeoning. Uh, the success of coming up and the circumstances in which we have beaten the odds had allowed me to weave a mythical web of indestructibility around myself. Um, I had developed an illusion that there was very little I could do to avoid success and therefore a sudden veering off into addiction, teaching myself to write music in a completely alien way, just seemed like diverting paths on a point to continue good fortune. And by this point, I had also earned an obscene amount of money, an eye-watering vigour from having re-signed the publishing deal after the success of coming up and its consequential tide of industry goodwill. Um, and he says that windfall was one of the factors that led to a disintegration. You know, you start to believe that everything that you've ever done is good and therefore you will continue to be good in everything that you do because you've been successful. And I think sometimes when you think about some, some major, major artists, uh, I'm going to think about maybe Prince as a good example. Um, when you are surrounded by people that agree with you and think that everything that you do is genius, it's really, really difficult to have someone to push back and say, no, this is not a good idea. Um, and so... What we found during the recording sessions for head music, in, in my opinion, and bearing in mind I'm only seeing this from the outside, is, is we had you know one of the most talented guitarists of a generation that was being told to put down his guitar and pick up a synthesizer. Um, we had Brett working on his own in a very, very primitive fashion, creating these, these kind of rhythmic tracks, so things like Can't Get Enough, for example. Uh, and there's some, some recording footage that's on the Insatiable Ones DVD that shows you that the, the band were trying to work around, you know, the fact that the band were disintegrating. Um, so, you know, Richard um, was, was drinking, um, and Neil was not very well at all. Uh, I think he had an ME. And, um, you know, Brett was trying to, to write songs on his own in his shed with an eight track and a drum machine. And we came out with these very heavy, dense, rhythmic tracks, which um, didn't have a huge amount of melody in it. So putting all of that into one place, what you've got, you've got a band that's got, you know, very, very well known for doing um, accessible outsider anthems around the underdog, um, ladling guitars, we're suddenly abandoning all of that and going in a completely different direction and becoming something cool, cold, clinical, um, dripping in synthesizers, part Kraftwerk, part David Bowie, part Lou Reed. Uh, it was a really bizarre combination for the band. Um, and, it, it, you know, when, when the final album was released, it was not amazing. I, I'm going to have to, you know, I can't pretend that it was. It wasn't. So we had uh, May 1999, two months after the album came out. Sorry, two months after the album recording sessions finished, we saw the release of Head Music. Now, in this uh, masterwork here, uh, and I say masterwork because it is a really bloody good um, biography of a band. And, um, you know, Matt's asked about... Well, what, why, why did the, the band put, put the album out? And uh, I think uh, what he said was, um, we finished the record because it wasn't getting any better and it had to come out. Um, and these, I went out to play pool with some friends and it totally hit me that I wasn't enjoying a single moment of it. These were people moaning about their day who worked in shops and I'm listening to people moaning about their jobs. But if I was to start on my day, I just thought, well, I'm going to see how the tour goes, see whether it works, because I'm not doing this again. There's no point in doing this again, because it should either be great music or it should be fun. Uh, and by the end of it, when we were doing High Five for the 500th time, or maybe the track Head Music, I was thinking this wasn't very good. And, and, and that's, you know, uh, that's really blunt. You know, head Music as an album is, is deeply, deeply flawed. And I'm going to talk through that. Um, step by step now although it's taken me 15 minutes to get this far who knows i might even get to the end of the record by the end of the 45 minutes um head music was released in may 1999 
and the album was preceded by by three warm up shows in in late March at Glasgow's Garage, Manchester University, and the London Astoria, which were fan club shows. And I went to the Manchester show, and the Manchester show started at eight and finished at nine thirty. Um, and at that point, we took the last train home. So the last train out of Manchester towards Birmingham, where I was living, was nine thirty. Suede were meant to finish at nine thirty. I had a cab booked for nine twenty. And quite literally, the minute that the main song of the main set, Cracking the Union Jack, finished, we ran out of the, the university into a cab that drove straight to the, the train, and we got the train by about 30 seconds. Um, that's a kind of madness I still do, because frankly, music's the best thing, and it saved my life. Um, when I heard those songs, um, and I thought, these these are really good songs. Yeah, these are good, strong pop songs. They're a little bit darker a little bit denser and at that point I wasn't a fan of David Bowie I got into David Bowie next year in the year 2000 um, and I like had no reference point around things like Low or Heroes or Lodger for example I had um, a, a limited reference point around Kraftwerk so what I was thinking is this band were doing this, this new and exciting sound that sounded European and, and vaguely industrial and vaguely mechanical and that was completely uh up my my street entirely because of course i love ministry i love nine inch nails i love craft work um i love the david bowie stuff i just haven't heard it because to me david bowie was was often still you know uh, a twat in white white a white suit and a jacket singing let's dance you know i hadn't really got into his, his darker stuff at that point um but i heard those songs at manchester and i thought this is this album's going to be brilliant it's going to be very good but of course when you're in a band, you play your best songs live. You don't play your stinkers live, do you? Well, some bands play their stinkers live. Some band sets are all stinkers. Um, and I'm not going to talk about those ones, but let me just say, I've seen the Stereophonics many, many times. I have never paid. I have never wanted to see them. They have always been either supporting or headlining. And I've always tried to avoid them as much as is humanly possible because I like my meat and potatoes on a plate and not on Spotify. Anyway, with all that bitching to one side... Um, the first single from the album was called Electricity, and there was some debate around whether Electricity was the right choice for the first single or not. Some people inside the band wanted a song called Head Music to be the single. Uh, I think that, I think maybe a couple of people that worked in the office did. Obviously, they're completely wrong in that assessment, but the band went completely overboard. So they had, they had, um, a Virgin Mega Stores, I think, was rebranded Head Music for the week that the album came out. Um, the first single which is called electricity was to put it technically formatted to fuck ladies and gentlemen that's a technical phrase there um so we've got two cd singles we've got a cassette single and we've got the world's first mini disc single um for electricity and electricity is is a great but cynical song so if if trash is like having mind-blowing sex with somebody that you love electricity is like having really rotten dirty great sex with somebody that you don't care about that you're never going to see again the song doesn't have the meaning that songs like trash do and uh brett is fairly scathing about electricity in here i think he calls it a four and a half minute waste of time which is Probably harsher than I would be about it, uh, but it's certainly not the best first single that, that Suede did. So, Electricity, as I said, two CD singles, uh, one backed with Pop Star and Killer, and one backed with See That Girl and Waterloo. All great songs, by the way. Often what you'll find around about this period is the band put some of their worst tracks on the album and some of their best tracks on B-sides. Um, now, in the, in the days when there were cassette singles, or cast singles, which is probably the ugliest word in the English language, um, the cassette singles had exclusive tracks on. So this has Implement Yeah on it, uh, which was written in the, in the pre uh, in the pre Bernard days. And here's um, the world's first. I think it says here the UK's first mini disc single, Electricity. There was literally a box of these in the band's office, and, and they were giving them away. Um, probably worth a small fortune now, actually. Uh, in the same way that the Smiths had a um, DAT commercial release of the album Rank. They made 100 copies of it. They sold less than 50, threw the rest in a bin. And now that that, that DAT sells for you know, an enormous amount of money to train spotters because there's only about 50 of them left in the world. Electricity as a mini disc single is, is utterly baffling. I have no idea why this thing exists. Uh, neither apparently does 
bread because somebody asked him once why did you put it out and he pointed to the band's label head and said ask him um it's a it's a really strange thing that and there's probably not many of them left in the world and there's probably less people that care about that but electricity was not a great first single it was um, a very much a repetition of, of trash but with all the soul taken out of it and i think a lot of people kind of just went oh that's what suede do now um, and that's backed up by the fact that the band don't play electricity live very often when they do it's really really good but they don't play it live very often and nor should they and it was followed up with a, a series of tv appearances i saw the band mime to electricity i think at um cd uk uh, and also at um a venue which was uh it, it, which is now i think the m m shop in leicester square uh and i think also blondie and i think westlife maybe boys own played as well and i i also was probably about 10 years older than anybody else who was there but watching suede uh, mime to she's in fashion and electricity um for that was you know uh, it was a pretty boring hour to be honest um, and I, I have vague, vague recollections of it. I've never seen it on YouTube. I'm sure it exists. I'm sure you can see me in the crowds. I genuinely don't care. Now, before the album was released, um, the band also played a show at a place called The Asylum in Perryvale in, in late April 1999 for a, 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 show, a TV show called Head Music. Um, actually, no, it's the 16th of April, 1999. Uh, and that, that show, or at least parts of it, is on the DVD that comes with the 2011 reissue of Head Music. Now, I went to that show. Um, like the, the Manchester show, the band played nothing but um, post-Bernard songs. Um, so, that you know, they didn't need to play Animal Nitrate, Wild Ones, Metal Mickey, We Are The Pigs, New Generation. No point because it uh, and you know actually it's really refreshing when a band puts its heart and soul and guts and, and goes behind and sticks to the the new stuff because i'm really really interested in bands making new stuff i'm interested in bands living in now um and if if bands i loved only played old songs i would love them a little bit less than bands that play new stuff so i saw i saw suede in manchester and i saw suede at perivale um, they played only new stuff so only stuff written by the band's then current guitarist, uh, Richard Oakes, a genius in human form. And uh, the Asylum in Perryvale, by the way, isn't a venue. Uh, it's a film studio on an industrial estate somewhere in Zone 6 in London, out in the West somewhere. It's a, it's a dump. And the, there were maybe 200, 250 people, maybe 300 people that were there, invite only. And the only way you could get a ticket was if you were sent to... It's a really fantastic ticket because it can't be replicated. It's a clear perspex sheet of PVC with print and a ticket number on there. Uh, impossible to replicate. Um, so very good at stopping touting, by the way. Um, but uh, the man played about 16, 17 songs, of which uh, eight are on the um, DVD here and also became the soundtrack to a, um, a live release, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but Perry Vale, again, at this point, I hadn't heard the album. I'd heard most of the songs from the album. Um, I, I think I got a live tape of, of them at the Astoria, uh, which was broadcast on the radio. Um, but, uh, you know, after the album was released, the band didn't play London uh, until... 2002 so after the album came out i think the last show that they played uh, was at the shepherd's bush empire for the MP mtv and they didn't play a headline show in london then for the next three years uh, until they played the royal festival hall in 2002 so what we, we're starting to see with the album is a series of i think commercial uh, and and uh, tour miscalculations that doesn't do the band any favors um, so, for example, they played three shows, um, either before or around the week that the album came out. So they played, you know, the Virgin Megastore, they played Shepherd's Bush Empire, they played Perry Vale for members of their fan club, they played Astoria for members of their fan club. If you weren't a fan club member, um, the only chance you would have to see the band would be either to see them play the Virgin Megastore, which, considering they'd headline Reading 18 months before, was practically impossible, or you could see them play the Shepherd's Bush Empire on a multi-artist bill, for MTV, which again would have sold out just like that. You know, the band didn't put a, a show at Brixton on in 1999, and they probably should have done. The nearest they came to that was playing the Red and River Meat Centre on, I think, the 30th of August. No, not 30th of August, 30th of October 1999. But I think it really hurt the band's 
commercial profile not playing a major London headline show around about the time of head music and there are another couple of missteps actually that he obviously at the time um, didn't feel like it but in retrospect very clearly became that and I think the biggest issue that the band had was the album itself it was um, for the first time a double album um, and here's the, the 2018 coloured vinyl Amazon reissue which comes in a lovely shade of purple Prince would be proud of that um but it's about an hour long and it, it, it i think they i think the song i think the album is maybe three or four songs too long so some of the best songs that the band had they didn't put on the album and some of the worst songs the band had they did put on the album so let's go through the track listing for the album head music i know it's taken me 25 minutes to get there but context is everything because without context manslaughter can be murder okay so we've got electricity which is the first song on the album and it's not the the best song to open the album with we've got savoir faire uh, can't get enough everything will flow down she's in fashion and and then you've got a, a four song run that's pretty tough tough going uh, asbestos head music elephant man hi-fi the band haven't played any of these songs since 2003 and then you've got like three great songs to end the album with, which is Indian Strings, He's Gone, and Crack in the Union, Jack. Um, first and foremost, the sequencing on this album is wonky. It, it's really sequenced in a very difficult way. Can't Get Enough should have been the opening track on the album. You know, it starts with all the instruments slowly coming in. It's an absolute belt of the band play it live, rips the roof off the place, even if it's outdoors. Um, and they somehow put it as the third song on the album. Electricity is the first single. It's not a great first single, as I've said before. It's, it's a little bit bubblegum. It's a little bit empty. Um, you know, I, I, I tried really, really hard to like Electricity, but it was kind of like going, if your girlfriend gets a haircut and you don't like it, but it's still your girlfriend, and you kind of go, well, I still fancy you. You just look different. Um, and then you've got uh, Savoir Faire, which has um, two of the worst lines in the entire of uh, recorded history, which are, uh, she lives in a house, she's stupid as a mouse, and it's dip dog shit. That is not a good lyric. I know that's one that Brett's disowned. And it's probably one of the reasons why the band haven't played the song live for quite some time. Musically, it's okay, it's fine, it, it's it's average it's an okay album track but suede albums deserved better than that especially when you've got the kind of you know lyrical power that you have in in the in coming up and dogman star and suede to then go to that level of banality was, was quite depressing to be honest um yeah you've got can't get enough and then you've got everything will flow uh down and she's in fashion now everything will flow is a fantastic track the band play it live many, many times. And She's in Fashion is also equally fantastic. And I think probably She's in Fashion alone has probably paid for a number of houses in London because it's on every single show ever about fashion. Um, and the band knew this. So they had a second single from the album. Now, in Australia, the second single was Can't Get Enough, uh, which is backed with live versions of Electricity, uh, Trash and Beautiful Ones recorded at the Perry Vale show uh, and I think was it trash uh, and beautiful ones were not may not have been on the TV broadcast of head music um, and of course since I've mentioned it previously we have cassette singles still cassette singles it's painful having cassette singles uh, but on the B side of the cassette single of of um, she's in fashion is uh, the demo of down and uh, I must admit, I've never done a side-by-side -side check with the later release demos. It may be exclusive to that cassette. Um, now, She's in Fashion, alongside all the uh, the singles from this period, was designed by Peter Saville and, and his, his design group. So you have that, which is a promotional CD, which has a different image on the front. And I, I think this is a fantastic image. It should be, it should have been the single cover, as opposed to, to this, uh, which has... Four B-sides on there. It's got Boards, which is one of the best suede B-sides that there is. Pieces of My Mind, uh, Jubilee and God's Gift. I mean, really, at this point, the band were shitting out incredible B-sides. Uh, you know, and you've got eight songs there that are better than um, Head Music or Asbestos or Hi-Fi. Um, which, by the way, the band 
um, have said they do not like those particular songs. Now, next up, and perhaps a little bit more more accessible, I think, was um, the next single, which is Everything Will Flow. Um, and this is a promotional CD, again, uh, but two CD singles there, backed with Weight of the World and Leaving on here, and uh, Crackhead and Seascape. Crackhead's a great track. It's dark, it's dirty, it would have made a great album opener, um, but it would have really very, very clearly, you know, set out that we're, we're not... Um, we're not the suede that that we used to do or the suede we used to be and way to the world is pretty good leaving is excellent and uh, leaving was a bonus track on a cd single on some of the editions of of the the head music album if you bought it in um i think fnac in france for example leaving was a one track cd um the band also made uh, a cd single which was only released in america um and uh, th this is everything will flow um the uh the remixes uh cd single which has three remixes by by rollo of faceless faceless um those remixes are very bad indeed and they've never been reissued and i think they've been pretty much disowned by the band and and also uh there was a 12 inch which i think is a promotional 12 inch and what you can really see here is, you know, the band have got a lot of money at this point because they're putting out promotional 12 inches and die cut sleeves uh, with exclusive remixes on. Um, it, it has a lovely 12 inch. And by the way, um, they also had uh, suede branded carrier bags here, uh, which I've been storing my copy of the Everything Will Flow 12 inch in for a number of years. In fact, I've not taken it out of that since probably the last Minelia. Um, and what the band also did at the same point, cassette single of Everything Will Flow Back with Beautiful Ones Live from Perivale, which of course you've already got on the Australian CD, and Give Me Head. Um, this is bizarre. It really is. This was uh, sold through the fan club for about £3. It's a foam VHS tape that you could probably play no more than 10 times before it disintegrated. Uh, this one is sealed. Hasn't been opened since it was manufactured. It's bizarre. I could probably bend it. Um, I have no idea why I've got it, apart from the fact that I haven't thrown it away. And it's a weird thing that I can use in videos like this. So this is a five minute film about the making of head music which of course is on uh, this dvd here so you don't need to buy it and it's on youtube because everything's on youtube these days other things um that the band did um they they released a the fourth and final single can't get enough and it came in a slip case if you're on the band's mailing list lo and behold i was on every band's mailing list uh, there's some postcards uh, there's some there's an advert for the for the tour. I love this picture actually it's a great picture um, and uh, then there's you know some some other stuff about the suede information service some pictures some stickers and some random old bits and bobs which I've somehow stuffed in there over the years can't get enough came on three CDs instead of two CDs and a cassette because cassettes are a dead format and if there are nothing if not a collector of dead formats so can't get enough was backed with on one cd let go and since you went away those again incredible b-sides should have been on the album um situations and read my mind not so great b-sides but then we are at the 12th b-side of the period so we've got 25 songs that have come out in about five months uh and then we've got um We've got a third CD, which is backed with uh, the remix of Everything Will Flow, because it's not been released in, in uh, Britain before, and the uh, Steve Leone version of uh, She's in Fashion, which may or may not be on the reissues. I can't remember. The band did an awful lot of work here. They recorded many, many different versions with many different producers of many of the songs from the album. They really worked very, very hard to get a good album, and at some point they had to throw their hands up and go, Fuck it, we can't do any better and release what they've got. And uh, Let Go, the B-side, was so good that it got released in, I think, Sweden as a CD single. And Let Go is a fantastic B-side track. Um, it should have been on the album. There's no ifs, there's no questions about that. It is 
brilliant, and I wish the band would play it live more often. Now, whilst the band was still going, there was a couple of other things. Here is a, a limited edition CD um, promoting their European tour that shrink wrapped to some versions of uh, coming up, uh, not coming up, head music, sorry. Um, and it features five live songs from the Perry Vale show on CD. Uh, and also um, the band wrapped up the tour with, with a show in Israel. And then they released a fan club CD called Sessions CD, which is here, uh, which features acoustic versions of Since You Went Away, Everything Will Flow. And I think By The Sea and Another No One, which was recorded for IDF Radio in Tel Aviv. And... Um, can't get enough beautiful ones, Savoir Fair and Saturday Night recorded at the Perryvale Asylum. They really got their money's worth out of that show because it wasn't cheap. So that brings us to the end of the the, the head music period. Um, I saw the band many, many times during, during the head music era. I saw them at Manchester. I saw them do a couple of TV shows. I saw them do Perryvale. Uh, I saw them headline V99 in Stafford uh, where they didn't play electricity. Um which was a strange choice. Um, and I don't think that helped their commercial prospects either because you're not playing the lead single off your most recent album. It kind of indicates you don't really like it necessarily. Um, they And I also saw them at the Wolverhampton Civic Hall in October 1999. And, and that was a very, very bad show. For me, my personal experience of the Wolverhampton show was catastrophically bad. Um, my partner at the time was very, very upset and it was just awful, really. It, it, there was nothing about the show was bad. Swade played an incredible show, um, but just our relationship pretty much ended that night, and we'd been together for three years. Um, so it was awful, um, and I, I, I genuinely don't think I did anything wrong uh, there. Um, they'd had some awful news, and they decided that they were go, still going to go out and go and see Swade, and that was the wrong call. Uh, and it all went catastrophically wrong, really, and bad after that. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, it's history, and it doesn't occupy much space in my mind, to be honest. It's more just a historical overview. So there was a couple of other things. Um, the head music tour. Here's another head music carrier bag, because you can never have enough head music carrier bags. And here is, of course, a tour programme um, that actually has got some pretty exciting pictures in it. Um, and some pretty unexciting, unexciting pictures in it too. Um, I think the band made a bit of a mistake here, uh, and I won't say that uh, in a negative way. They did almost everything right, with, with two exceptions. One is that the final track selection for Head Music is, is, is really poor. Um, the songs Asbestos, Hi-Fi, Head Music um, are not good. Um, Brett... In the, t in the text that accompanies the 2011 reissue of Head Music, is very, very clear that the Head Music uh, title track is risible, uh, are his exact words, um, and also that some of the other songs that were on here, uh, such as Hi-Fi, had never been rehearsed or planned to be played live. And, you know, the Head Music track itself is, is pretty awful. So... 2011 saw the start of reissues for Suede. We had a, a three disc set here of, of head music. It's got the album on, on disc one. It's got four demos, which are Indian strings, everything will flow, he's gone and she's in fashion. It's got all the B-sides on, on the second disc, a previously unreleased track called Music Like Sex. And then the DVD had uh, five videos, um, two extra short films, um, and the Perry Vale TV appearance, plus an interview with uh, Brett, Richard and Neil. It's a really good package. Um, there's not much duplication in this, uh, in, the, in the 2019 20th anniversary edition version of the album. So you do need to get both of them. And the version of He's Gone that's on here, the protocol demo, may or may not be the same version that appeared on a compilation album called No Boundaries. Um, I don't care whether it is or whether it isn't. I've got both of them. Um, but the four demos on here are really good. So if, if you need a complete set, you do you do need to get this version of the album. And then in 2019, uh, there was another version of the album that was released. Uh, this is the Record Store Day 2019. Three 
LP version that has the two albums and the two vinyl discs for the album on, plus I think 10 extra B-sides on there. And it's a coloured vinyl edition because everyone knows you just put it on a different colour and that helps it sell. So I think it's white, purple and I don't know another colour. I don't particularly care, uh, to be honest. Um, but if you want all the B-sides from Head Music on vinyl, this is probably the best version to get. And finally, there was a, a five-disc set version of it. If you ordered it from Amazon, uh, it came with a, a signed lyric sheet for Indian strings. Um, if you didn't order it from Amazon, you didn't get that. Uh, but this is a, a very, very good multi-disc set version of the album. So it's got head music on one disc. It's got the B-sides on a second disc. It's got demos and alternate versions and outtakes, unused mixes and an acoustic fan club show on CDs 3 and 4. Uh, and what that means is effectively you have got uh, 26 demos. Almost all of them haven't been released before. Some of them are pretty scrappy, but they're fascinating insights uh, and very, very comprehensive. So you get a really great look into what was going on in the making of head music and it really gives you a very very good insight into i think the the confusion that i think the band was was feeling as it was feeling its way into a new configuration of the band away from the the poppy guitar band and into something that was darker and sleeker and more more european um you've got four songs from an acoustic show and then you've got a dvd and the dvd is crap on this by the way it is six songs it's a uh, later we with Jules Holland appearance, plus four Top of the Pops mimed appearances. No interviews, no promos, none of the live shows, and many, many live shows were recorded for this. Uh, nothing from Ross Killed in 1999, which was actually released in 2003. And the Ross Killed show, they played three very, very different sets over three nights on three different stages at the Ross Killed Festival. They barely repeated a song between the sets. They did almost like a B-Sides, an oddity set. They did a greatest hit set. They did like an album track set. Um, they're all circulating on the internet. Please go and find them. They're great, great, great live recordings, but none of them are on here, uh, which kind of makes you wonder why. And the DVD is, what, six songs, three of which are mine. It's maybe 20, 25 minutes long. Um, buy this for the audio. Don't buy it for the DVD. Um, I'm just mildly narked by the absence of extra material which clearly exists that the band have access to that they could have put on that dvd or nothing but it's no big deal and that brings us to the end of the head music period um okay so i think i've said i said there's two there's two areas where i think the band band kind of made missteps around head music one is the final track selection of the album they put some of their worst songs on the album and they put some of their best songs on the b-sides i'm going to post up an alternative preferred track listing to this on the uh, on the on the YouTube page, uh, and then the the other thing that they did wrong was I think they really they really misbooked the uh, the UK tour. Um, there was talk about going into arena around about Christmas 1999, which the band then changed, going back into the kind of venues that they've been playing since '93. So the civic halls, the town centres, the you know the, the leisure centres, and, and and you know converted gyms and those kind of places, um, and that in itself. It, it's you know it's a great job. It's a better job than working at a desk all day long in all probability. Um, but the band had lost its focus, and I think also the band made a mistake by not playing a major London show after the release of Head Music. Uh, people didn't see Suede on the Head Music tour unless you went to see them play a festival in Chelmsford or you were in the fan club in and around London. Um, and I think they really, really should have played somewhere like Brixton Academy in late 1999 to remind people what a potent and vital live force that they were. Um, and as, as Brett is very honest about himself, um, he was taking a lot of drugs and he, he started to believe his own hype around what he was really, really good at. And as the excerpt from the section that I read to you earlier kind of indicated, the album wasn't really as good as it could have been. The final track selection wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, and the band perhaps kept their eye on, on countries outside the UK, as opposed to also focusing on, on London. Um, and I think London repaid that by not, not being that bothered about them uh, for a couple of years afterwards. Um, I'm going to wrap up here. I'm running out of time. I barely scratched the surface of some of the other stuff relating to Suede, um, which I'm no doubt I'm going to do in a future episode. I've not even mentioned the T-shirt, which I've got here, which, uh, by the way, is a cruise shirt. And on the back, it says tour dates, 
cities, blah, blah, etc, etc. Um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, don't know what the next one's going to be about. Don't know when I'm going to do it. As usual, don't be a dick in the comments. I'll post up links to some live shows from the period. And I'll also uh, post up what my alternate track listing for the Head Music album would have been. Um, it's been lovely to spend some time with you. Maybe at some point, when Sway play gigs again, we can all spend some time together in the same room at the same time, singing the same songs, all out of tune. Thank you very much. And uh, see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye.